This is a public health announcement brought to you by Heather Shepard. The Primal Pioneer. Live an outdoor life. Welcome to the Primal Pioneer Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Shepard, radical health practitioner and creator of the Sunlight RX. As a radical health practitioner, I teach people how to improve their health using practical yet incredibly powerful nature-based resources and practices. I do so by utilizing my health trifecta, the Sunlight RX, EMF mitigation, and my jet fuel diet. This approach has helped me heal my TBI, poor gut health and anxiety levels, and continues to help thousands of people around the world access root causes of their health struggles as well. During today's episode, I talk all about the immune system. During this time of COVID, we're being fed very misleading and inaccurate information regarding how to protect our health and actually boost immunity. Throughout this episode, I talk about how you can gauge the health of your immune system how prescription and over-the-counter drugs impact immunity. I discuss herd immunity and talk about the importance of taking measures to boost immunity versus suppressing it. Now, let's dive into this episode to learn all about immune health, the benefits of fevers, and nature's medicine kit. Today, I'm going to talk about the immune system. We're going to get into fevers, herd immunity, and how you can start to detect the state of your health by learning to read the symptoms and signs that your immune system is giving you. What this does, it allows you to see how deep the pathology that your body's currently struggling with may be in your body. And when we know how deep the pathology is, we can more accurately create a treatment strategy and a timeline of recovery. So a lot of people who come into my practice, they often ask, how long is this going to take? How long is it going to take me to feel better? How long is it going to take my digestion to recover? And really, this answer is different for each person. And one of the things that this is based on primarily is how deep the pathology is in your body. And I'll get into that throughout this episode, but I just want to preface by saying the same person with the seemingly same disorder. So let's take two people with breast cancer. Um, Their prognosis or um, ability to recover successfully largely depends on how deep the pathology is in their body. And each individual is likely going to have a different state of health or the pathogen is going to be at a different level of health. So two different people uh, with the same disorder can actually have a different prognosis depending on how deep the pathology is in their body. And I'll get into what that means throughout this episode. Now, I do want to mention that throughout this episode, I do talk about COVID and the disadvantages of our modern approach to this virus. And hopefully this episode will allow you to take more proactive measures around any pathogenic exposure and how to best support your health and immune system when faced with an acute or chronic condition. This information is not based on any politics. It's just simply based on the education and the educational healthcare training that I've received throughout my undergrad studies, throughout my master's studies in alternative medicine, and uh, throughout my current ongoing studies to become a homeopathic doctor, okay? And um, you will find and see that the recommendations, and, and when I talk more deeply about the immune system, And the recommendations I give there around boosting immunity are very different than what the mainstream media is feeding us today. So when we have this information, we can better prepare our bodies to fight off infection. And we can also just approach our health and and when we do get an infection in more proactive, empowering ways. 
So today I'm going to touch on three important steps to boosting immunity that draws upon ancient healing practices utilized by indigenous tribes, our ancient ancestors, and healers before the invention of antibiotics, vaccines, and OTC drugs or over-the-counter drugs um, made their way onto the scene. And so I want to start with herd immunity. And there are many articles coming up now downplaying the benefits of herd immunity and even uh, are promoting and considering it as dangerous. It is not at all dangerous when you know how to utilize it and when you understand um, how you need to be connected to nature, not your iPhone or other modern technology in order for herd immunity to actually work. Our medical establishments really push and ingrain nothing but fear into us around our health. This is not a healthcare system that we're working with and that we have in place today, but it is a sick care system. It feeds sickness. Its medicines promote sickness, meaning the quote unquote medicine or pharmaceuticals that they prescribe feed sickness. Its facilities are not a place of healing, but are a place that people actually try to avoid and um, try to spend the least amount of time in Western allopathic facilities, hospitals. They try to limit their time in these places because of the high rates of infection, superbugs and co-infections that bombard our hospitals today. So our medical system is not feeding or supporting health. When we truly understand the role of illness, we can start to see clearly that sickness actually feeds health. And that may sound like super counterintuitive and uh, confusing, but throughout this episode, you're really going to get a better grasp of what I mean there. Um, so when we approach our health and illness from a place of wisdom and intelligence, we can really see that illness actually plays a major role in helping facilitate health and wellness. And this is one reason why wearing masks, staying six feet apart, and using hand sanitizer feeds sickness because it's not focusing on helping us get well. It's not strengthening our immune system. It's actually suppressing our immunity. And um, this is actually going to further fuel illness on all levels, okay? Being around acutely sick people is hardly ever life-threatening, but is actually immune-boosting in many, many cases when you know how to practice herd immunity as the ancients did. Now, we typically view sickness as a weakness. We try to prevent being sick at all costs, we take prescriptions and over-the-counter meds to quote-unquote prevent sickness when really we need to start shifting our entire mindset around getting an acute illness such as the flu, a fever, a cold, or a cough and what that actually means because these can be among our biggest immune-boosting allies when we know and understand the role of acute illness and its correlation to the potential to support improved health. Now, before I dive into herd immunity, I do want to make a point that herd immunity will not have the same effects today as it did even 20 years ago if it's practiced in a modern technology dominated setting. Okay, more on that in a few, but herd immunity, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this term, basically works like this, okay? Let's say you have a five-year-old who has chicken pox. You also have a three-year-old. Um, maybe there's a handful of cousins, a few new friends. They're all playing together. They don't have chicken pox, but the five-year-old does, right? Okay? But you expose the other kids to the five-year-old, okay? They're outside playing tag. They're around each other. They're um, in the same space. And you expose the others to the five-year-old with chicken pox as a way to expose the non-carriers to the virus. When, why, why would you do this? This sounds absolutely insane to people who are, who are pro-vaccination and, and who uh, are very concerned about their child's health. I mean, who, who isn't as a parent? We're all concerned about 
our children's health. I know when my niece or nephew gets sick, I'm like, okay, well, let, let's keep an eye on things. What do we have to do here? You know, it's all, it's like full on. We're watching them. We're observing them. Um, and, and we're keeping an eye on them and, and trying to make the very, very best decisions to keep them safe and to protect them. We tend to freak out when kids get fevers, but when kids get fevers, this is typically not a time to panic. This might sound strange, but it's actually a time to celebrate. And also, of course, right? Watch your child and observe their body, their emotions as they go through this immune fighting process from whatever pathogen they're exposed to. Your kid's immune system is actually working hard to cleanse itself when it spikes, when they spike a fever, okay? And the immune system actually strengthens itself in the process. In fact, the health of the entire system strengthens when the pathogenic infection is allowed to run its course. So some, your, your child gets chicken pox, they have some, some outbreaks on their body, they spike a fever, maybe their appetite isn't as great, okay? Um, we want to keep a watchful eye on them, maybe possibly get to the point where we administer some homeopathics, which is really, really great medicine for kids and adults, but kids tend to respond much quicker because they're not as, uh, their sickness, their illness isn't at, as advanced as many adults. So it tends to have a much more rapid impact. Um, but we want to keep a watchful eye, of course. But really, we need to keep in mind that your kid gets a fever. This is their immune system at play, strengthening and helping their body um, to fight off the pathogen. So, and, and maybe you've heard of this, that um, growth and development milestones in our, our children actually tend to occur after an illness or a high fever. And this helps and allows children to actually um, achieve developmental, emotional, physical milestones in their life. So um, you'll likely, maybe you can look back on your own child's life and their experience with illness and childhood illness and how they, they maybe they sp uh, spiked the fever, had uh, an acute illness or infection for a few days. And then, you know, a week later, they had this huge like word explosion or they suddenly could do, you know, more advanced things with like Legos or art or they could have deeper emotional conversations. This is a typical um, result, uh, of after kids have fever fevers that they tend to achieve these new milestones throughout their developmental years. Um, and when it comes to fevers, however, most of us freak out, especially when it comes to our children. However, we want to keep in mind that this is not something we want to try to avoid. It's not something we want to try to suppress, but this is one of the main contributing factors to chronic disease today when we do suppress, when we do try to avoid the fever. And this inability to spike a fever is something that most adults today really struggle with. Even children are struggling more and more with this today. And we have to keep in mind that this is one of the biggest, uh, most powerful ways that the body and the immune system cleanses itself. When children especially get fevers, you know, we totally panic and freak out. And we've been taught that a high fever is dangerous. Mostly our fear around our kids having high fevers is the potential for them to get a seizure and go into a seizure um, mode uh, as a result of having a high fever. Now, I just want to mention that I've worked with children who've had high fevers of 103, 104, sometimes even getting to 105 Fahrenheit for three days in a row, okay, who have not once had a seizure as a result of their high fever. Um, and this is because of the interventions that they use and that I suggest when their child is going through a fever. Of course, if it gets to this place where it's a total red flag, you're going to want to intervene with the tools and resources that Western medicine gives us, but we want to try to avoid that as much as we can. Um, and typically, 
Uh, for those of you out there, parents who are concerned about seizures uh, and, and high fevers, the seizure response is typically due to low blood sugar and a lack of electrolytes. So your kid's getting dehydrated, the blood sugar is dropping as a result of the fever uh, being prolonged, okay? So they've had a fever for quite some time. They're starting to lose electrolytes. Their blood sugar is going down, okay? And so this occurs as a result of the fever and the body trying to burn up the pathogen. And making sure your child, this is, this is a, one thing that I do um, when somebody reaches out to me and wants uh, acute immediate help for their child with a fever is that um, we want to have 100% organic pure fruit juice on hand. Now, I'm not a huge fan of like fruit juice and fruit and all this stuff, but when you're in the middle of a fever, this can actually be really helpful because especially when you can, you can fresh press the, the juice using a Nordic juicer, which keeps the potassium intact and has this really great, um, maintains this great sodium potassium barrier in the, the vegetable fruit juices. Okay, this is a super effective way that I've found to prevent any seizure from long-term, in, in long-term meaning more than a day of having a high fever. So just keep pumping this really high quality juice into their system. Also, placing cold cloths on their neck, their abdomen, their face can help as well. If you or your child have a high fever, one super effective way to lower the fever is to try and stimulate a bowel movement. This is also another um, kind of tool or practice that uh, I call on or refer to in times of high fevers. Now, this may not be super easy to achieve in a kid. But if you can do this using an enema or homeopathics, or if you have access to colon hydrotherapy, which I talked all about in the last episode when I interviewed Amy, a colon hydrotherapist, um, on the benefits of colon hydrotherapy, these things can help expedite the removal of the pathogen from the body, and uh, it will allow the bowels to release. And when your bowels release, this is one of the fastest ways to remove pathogens from the body and is also a super, super effective way to remove heat from the body. So let's say you or your child has a high fever, you they have a bowel movement, you take their fever after the bowel movement, it's typically uh, one or two degrees at least lower than before the bowel movement. So this is can be a really effective way to uh, help move the pathogen out of the body and uh, remove heat from the body as well. Now, all you adults out there, this no, no shaming because I've been here, but I can count on my one hand how many adults can actually spike fevers over 101.8 on a regular basis. In fact, I can probably count on one or two fingers how many adults I know can do this. It has taken myself, honestly, a couple of years of detoxing pathogens, homeopathy, and sunlight therapy to be able to achieve this myself. So if you're an adult out there thinking, hey, that's me, I can't spike a fever for that long or you know, over 101.8, don't worry. It doesn't necessarily have to be, <laughs> you know, mean that there's something wrong with you or that this is a bad thing or that you're doomed. There's a lot you can do to support your immune recovery. So let's talk about this a little bit deeper with regard to the fever because uh, this is something that's not talked a lot about in a uh, conventional medical world. They try to suppress fevers. I'm suggesting that that's a very bad and dangerous idea, um, especially when it comes to our health. And so I want to take the next step here and kind of dive into fevers. Now, when I'm doing an intake with a client, one of the questions I ask is, when's the last time you had a fever and how high was the fever? And what did you do for the fever? Many adults say they can't remember the last time they had a fever. I'm talking over 101.8, you know, hopefully 102 or higher. Some remember having a low-grade fever and taking Tylenol or ibuprofen to help uh, bring the fever down, okay, which is a big red flag. We never want to do that unless it's like a total emergency situation. Most 
High fevers are not an emergency situation, but we've been trained by Western medicine to think that they are. So um, it's almost like we have to unlearn what we've been taught about fevers, dangerous seizures, you know, bad sign, and relearn that fevers are actually super beneficial and one of our biggest healing, health cleansing, immune stimulating allies um, that we actually want to move towards. Now, the majority of the cancer patients I work with today often say, I don't know why I got cancer. I haven't been sick in years. And then boom, out of nowhere, I got cancer. One major reason why adults get chronic illnesses and diseases is because they can't spike a fever. And they haven't been able to spike one for years. And they can't spike a fever because their immune system has been so suppressed over and over and over again for years and years as a result of taking antibiotics, over-the-counter drugs, chemo, and or radiation therapies, okay? Before the invention of antibiotics, fevers were a normal occurrence. Fevers are a way the immune system detoxes poisons, toxins, and germs from the body. Fevers are your house cleaners. They are your friend. So back to the herd immunity and the kids with chicken pox. We expose the group of kids to chicken pox, right? Two of them get it full on, two others get a fever, but no other major symptoms. The five-year-old fully recovers, no antibiotics needed, no vaccines needed. And everyone's immune systems are better because of it. They actually are preventing cancer and every single chronic disease or disease of aging by going through this experience, meaning they allowed the pathogen and the infection to run its course without suppression. So here's a couple key points regarding herd immunity. In order for herd immunity to work, you have to get yourself or your kids or whoever's involved in the immune boosting process in sunlight. They can't expect to have breakthrough immune boosting results while practicing herd immunity inside, playing on their tablet, around Wi-Fi, while on their iPads, et cetera. EMFs and artificial light, for those of you who've read the Sunlight Rx ebook or, and have been following me for quite some time, the, know that these things completely break down the immune system. Exposure to these things, non-native EMFs and artificial light, they'll make any acute or chronic disease worse because they hinder mitochondrial function. They disturb circadian biology. Um, there's a lot of studies out there showing that there are detrimental effects on the immune system. Um, usually these, these devices are, are held very close to our, our thymus gland, which is a huge, plays a huge role in immunity. And so we're just blasting the thymus gland with um, EMFs and artificial light. You know, when we hold our, our phone up, it's like right at the thyroid level, right? Or if we're on our computer. Um, you know, the thyroid's very, very close to the, uh, the skin. It's very, very close to the external areas of the body. So this area is very highly damaged by EMFs and artificial light. I've had so many people reach out to me saying, you know, my thyroid functions down, um, or I have thyroid cancer, or I have Hashimoto's. And for all of those people, one of the first questions I ask them is, um, do you hold your cell phone up? You know, how much do you use your cell phone because it's shining right into your thyroid gland? And uh, how often are, are you on the computer? Um, I had one individual who was like a cell phone tech and this individual was getting goiters on her thyroid gland and, and she, she would just hold the cell phone up uh, to around, the, to look at the screen. It was, it was super close to her thyroid gland, the thymus pretty much every day. She stopped this one thing and did the Sunlight Rx. The goiters went away on their own. So there's a huge correlation between EMFs and artificial uh, light exposure and the immune system and the thyroid gland. Okay, so story here, EMFs and artificial light break down the immune system. So we cannot have success with herd immunity when we're living in an artificial environment. 
Instead, the kids need to be in fresh air. They need to be outside under the power density of the sun. Okay, that was a little bit of a story and overview of herd immunity um, and a little bit about fevers there. And I'm going to continue to talk about fevers throughout this episode because they, they play a major role in our health. But I want to bring our attention to, to COVID for a minute here because those spouting COVID orders telling us to social distance at six feet, wear face masks, spray hand sanitizer before entering a building, or even I went to the farmer's market the other day, okay? And they're like, well, in order to enter, you have to um, put on hand sanitizer. And I totally faked it because I was like, yeah, okay. And put on like fake the hand sanitizer because it's absolutely ridiculous. It has nothing to do with boosting immunity, but actually does the opposite. Same thing with the plexiglass at the grocery store. Um, we're hindering our health on many levels, not only our immune function, but we're now interacting, uh, we're, we're actually not interacting that much with people. And community is life. We need community in order to be healthy. Uh, life and health is not just about, you know, eating good food and, you know, of course, being in sunlight. Those, of course, you all know me that those are major aspects to health. But if we don't have any community and connection, and if we're just connecting with people through a screen, that's really detrimental to the health of all the people on this planet. And it's exactly why um, murder rates and uh, people getting murdered in New York City now and deaths from murder are higher than deaths from COVID. And, but we're not talking about this. The media is not, not shining a light on this aspect or the calls to the suicide hotline has increased by 600% since COVID. Okay, so we're really, really um, doing a lot more disservice by the recommendations we're getting. And they're just making these things up like, oh, six feet apart. And then they make a, you know, they make up these rules based on no scientific, no real non-biased scientific evidence that staying six feet apart is actually even helpful or wearing a face mask is even helpful. I spoke with a nurse right in the beginning of when all this COVID stuff going on. And, and she was like, yeah, the, the um, administration came in and they said, hey, we all have to wear masks now. And, and I, all the nurses were like looking at each other because they were taught with regard to immunity and immune function, the exact opposite in nursing school. But my friend said within three days, nobody was questioning anything. They all wore their masks, despite what they learned in nursing school and immunology class. So be it. There it goes. We're just, we're just getting on the bandwagon and wearing the masks. So um, we're not looking at these deeper aspects of health and, and how to actually boost the immune system. This is, this is really uh, not based on any real science. It's not logical two of the six feet recommendations, um, the hand sanitizer, the, the mask wearing, there's no logic, there's no science to really back this stuff at all. But many people are taking it on blindly. And it's time to really question that, especially when, you know, you learn more about how the immune system works and what it means to, to actually be healthy. So it's really time to start questioning more and more, especially as we learn more about all these unfoldings under COVID. And there's a lot I can say about this. And, and hopefully I'm, I'm talking to a guest that hopefully next week I'll get on the show who's just researched COVID and the recommendations to death. I mean, this woman's an amazing researcher on this subject. And so um, I'm hoping to get her on the show next week to talk in more detail about this uh, for you all. So the current COVID recommendations suppress the immune system. They also promote fear. They create tension and war between one another. And if you don't follow the COVID rules, you're condoned as someone who doesn't care about the health of others. And you want to see babies and old people die. You know, it's like, and these are really intense um, accusations to give to someone. Um, and most people who are doing the accusing have no idea about health. And that's not a shame on anyone. That's like, if I were to go into um, a metal making company 
and tell them how to weld their metal um, and that they were doing it wrong and, and they have to do it this way because I read it, you know, somebody tell me that and I'm just spouting what they said. And they've been doing it for years and years and years. Why, why should they listen to me and who am I to, to give them recommendations? So that's what's going on with the COVID now is that the recommendations were being given regarding COVID. There's not based on science. It's not based on logic. And the people aren't actually even experts when it comes to health and our immunity. So just keep that in mind. It's like, you, you want to question everything. What is this really helping? Why six feet? And not why six feet, because don't, don't just repeat something somebody else said, but we really have to dive into it and look deeper. Why face masks, you know? Um, so we really want to start looking at the, the deeper uh, realities here. There's no science here, and it's not even what um, people are taught in med school. I just saw a post, uh, an article. There were over 6,000 doctors who had signed this paper saying how the COVID recommendations are not supportive of health and immunity. But we're not getting that message. We're not getting that message from the mainstream. If you're looking to truly boost immunity and prevent viruses and other pathogenic diseases like COVID, you've got to boost your vitamin D levels via sunlight, not a pill. Study after study reveals that the higher one's vitamin D levels are from sunlight, the lower their instance of all-cause mortality. What this translates to in super simple terms is that the higher your solar vitamin D levels are, the less likely you are to die from any disease. You can start boosting your vitamin D levels right now by heading over to my site, heathershepherd.com to pick up your copy of the Sunlight RX eBook. This ebook will take you through my four-step process that teaches you how to use each solar spectrum to boost vitamin D levels. When you do this, your immune system boosts and overall health boosts as well. Now, let's get back to the episode to learn more about the immune system and its role in health. We want to keep this one very important thing in mind. Conventional medicine has never once cured any disease. They don't claim to cure diseases because they can't. They can't cure diseases because the resources and practices they utilize, they don't cure disease. They squelch and suppress disease. It's a system that portrays to be helping people, right? And it portrays to be supporting health when in fact it's fueling sickness. So let's take some examples here. If you get a CAT scan and that scan shows a tumor on your liver, you go in for surgery, they remove the tumor, you're actually not cured. The tumor might be gone for now, but what actually caused the tumor is still in your body. It's still in your energetic genetics. It's still in your field and it's likely still in your immune system. If you go in for heart surgery, for let's say a faulty valve, right? One of your valves isn't working optimally. They replace the valve. You are not cured because you're not a car. You're not just a bunch of metal scrap and plastic pieces. Why was your valve faulty? Okay, we need to go deeper with our questions, right? Why was your valve faulty? For whatever reason that was driving the faulty valve. And, and typically I found this when there's heart valves that aren't functioning optimally, these typically are related to bacterial uh, or viral germ toxins that have actually been, um, valves are one area of the body that they, they have an affinity to. Uh, they like to, to store themselves in these places. A lot of people um, who've had, say, scarlet fever, um, which is a form of streptococcus bacteria, that bacteria often gets uh, on the heart valves and they can cause issues later in life. There's other things that can cause it, staph infections, uh, and there's a lot of different causes of, of faulty heart valve function. Typically, I found it to be related to bacterial 
or viral germs and their toxins that make their way onto these valves. And they've been suppressed, right, by antibiotics from a strep infection, scarlet fever, or a staph infection that you had as a kid or a young adult. So um, let's say you had one of those infections or multiple of those infections as a kid or young adult. What do you do? Of course, antibiotics. That's what I was taught as a kid. I was given antibiotics anytime I had strep throat as a kid, an ear infection, right? That's their protocol. And we don't question it. That's what we do. But when we have diseases or disorders come up as adults, we have to look deeper into the health history as to what actually might have been causing this in the first place. So before we start taking barking orders from the very heavily censored media and medical establishment, first we have to take a look at their track record. What percentage of people have they cured? Do they have your best interest in mind? The answer is they haven't cured anybody and they've never had our best interest in mind. Not for one second. I wish they did. That would be awesome. But their sugar-coated messages like hashtag stop the spread, hashtag stay at home, save lives, hashtag flatten the curve, and all the pink ribbons for breast cancer make them appear and look like, I'm just going to say it, their shit don't stink, but it stinks and it stinks bad. So here's to questioning and looking deeper at what really causes sickness. So this leads us to, let's take a look at healing, what it really is and what it entails. Okay, so first, health and healing require body awareness. We need to be aware of our bodies, how they feel physically, emotionally, how they respond when we put certain things in them or on them. We need to start paying closer attention to our bodies and how they respond to our environment. Unfortunately, we no longer know how to read our body before, during, after sickness. We don't really know what that feels like. So one of the keys to health is learning how to read your body. You want to tap into how it's feeling, you know, when you're feeling really awesome, when you're feeling a little bit run down, you know, when you're feeling sick, we need to really pay attention to the signs and symptoms our body's giving us, whether we're, we're feeling awesome and good and healthy or whether we're feeling a little run down or more towards the sick end of the stick. So. We also have lost all touch with knowing how to overcome illness naturally. Herbs, homeopathy, and natural therapies such as hydrotherapy, sun therapy, that was actually a thing. There were things called, there were, there were institutions, there were um, places you would go to heal called solariums, which actually utilized sunlight to help people heal. This was super, super popular, especially for things like TB, tuberculosis, and uh, for wound healing after, after the war. So we've replaced these therapies, these natural elements, however, with penicillin, with Robitussin, with Vicks Vaporub, with Tylenol, with prescription drugs, corticosteroids, chemo, radiation, We've learned how to push our bodies so hard and so far today, we've become so engaged in technology and social media that we've lost connection to our health and to our body and to the messages that it's giving us every second of the day. No longer are we paying attention to the signs that our body's actually revealing. And these signs usually precede full-blown acute and chronic illness, right? So if we get a runny nose, if we are feeling run down, if we're getting a headache, if um, we start to get leg cramps for a few nights in a row, these are all kind of like foreshadowing of what's to come if we don't address this, okay? But we're not paying attention. We're not paying close enough attention to these signs and symptoms that our body is giving us. We don't pay attention. 
until our body has literally hit the wall. So when we have that full-blown bronchitis or strep throat or pneumonia or the flu or even cancer, then we start to pay attention. When our body presents with a symptom, okay, let's say a runny nose, let's say a sore throat, let's say a fever, even swollen joints or asthma, cough, pain in the body, symptoms are not actually bad, okay? So we don't want to actually repress these. We, if we have a little pain in our knee, we don't want to reach for the ibuprofen bottle. If we have a runny nose, we don't want to quickly reach for the Claritin pill. If we have a fever, we don't want to immediately take Tylenol. If we want to come into our power around our health, we have to shift our perspective from judging symptoms as bad to viewing symptoms as information. And we have to avoid suppressing them when we can. And this is because symptoms are messengers. They are signs that the body's giving us. This is a line of defense that's called upon um, by your immune system to try and prevent the disorder from going deeper into your body. We've forgotten how to use our body as a roadmap, as a messenger, right? But we can remember, this is a big part of my work as, as a radical health coach, teaching people how to get better and come to know their body and what it needs to thrive and be well, to just simply start to help them bring more attention to their body and how they're feeling and the signs and symptoms their body's giving them. When we experience symptoms, our first reaction is to suppress Okay, antibiotics, prescription drugs, over-the-counter drugs, this is typically the first thing our mind thinks and goes to regarding getting better, and we have to remove the symptoms. That's what we've been trained to think, so of course, that's what we're going to think. Now, sometimes it's okay to be sick, and it doesn't mean that your health is poor if you spike a fever or you have symptoms here and there. If you're experiencing symptoms, and if you can spike a fever, I'm just going to say it, good for you, pat yourself on the back, it means your pathology isn't buried too deep in your body. This typically presents a very good prognosis. However, if you choose to suppress those symptoms, let's say you can't sleep, right? Okay, so, so what's some of the options that we, we go for there? Let's see, some people go the natural route and take melatonin, right? And then, uh, you know, we have Ambien and other sleep medications that other people rely on, or even CBD. Why not? Let's sleep, right? Whether it's natural or pharmaceutical grade or over the counter, when you take something without exploring the deeper layers, there is a degree of suppression going on. And of course, it's more advanced when you're using pharmaceutical and over-the-counter drugs, but also if you're just taking something like melatonin or uh, CBD to help promote sleep, we're not getting to the root of the issue. Now, the prescription drugs really suppress the symptoms, and they suppress it, and then you can go back to work. Uh, your child can go back to school. You can finish your to-do list. You can prevent letting people down that rely on you, right? but you're actually doing more harm to your body than good when you take this route, especially over and over and over. Symptom after symptom after symptom typically results in prescription after prescription after prescription. Now this could be over the counter, something like Claritin, something like NyQuil, something like Sudafed, right? Okay, each time you, you go this route and you, you get into this pattern, you suppress. And each time you take the prescription, you push the disorder deeper into the body. There's different layers that the pathogen can actually be at in your body. Okay, it can be more of a surface layer, it can be middle range, or it could be super buried deep down into your body, right? So each time you suppress, and each time you take the prescription, that disorder is pushed deeper into the body. You actually aren't removing the pathogen. You're just pushing it down deeper. It's like, it's like, let's just say you have strep throat and you take a prescription and the strep throat goes away after the antibiotic. 
we think the strep is gone, but it's not. It's pressed down into a deeper layer of your body. And then you get strep throat again, and then you take another prescription drug, and it's pressed down even deeper into your body. This is why a lot of the people I work with who've had reoccurring strep throat uh, or strep infections, ear, throat, as a child, they have poor sleep. They have constipation and sluggish digestion. They have brain fog and brain health issues like depression and anxiety because they have a high level of streptococcus bacteria in their colon. Started out in the throat, right? It's more of a surface layer. Ends up in the colon, pretty deep layer, okay? That's one really common example that I see so, so routinely and often in my practice. Over time, when we do this suppression pattern over and over again, this weakens the immune system and over time prevents your body from being able to achieve the most effective immune arsenal we all have, which is the ability to spike a fever. This is why a lot of people I work with, as I mentioned here, um, who have cancer are so baffled as to why they got cancer because they haven't been sick in years. So they want to know how in the hell they suddenly got cancer. It doesn't make sense according to the linear boxed-in approach that our medical education and medical system has taught us about medicine, health, and healing, right? So now that you understand how the immune system works, how important fevers are, how it's important to let an infection, a disease, a disorder run its course with the most minimal amount of suppression as we can and how the immune system doesn't work when it's bombarded with drug after drug after drug, you can see how a cancer diagnosis can come up even when and especially when one hasn't been sick for years. This is why one of my main goals for my radical health clients with cancer is to help move their body towards producing a fever. And some people, this can take a few months and others a few years. If there's been chemo and radiation involved, it can take more like a few years, if ever. Sometimes depends on the state of, of health and the, and the pathology one's experiencing, but some people can't get back to that fever producing state. But I found in most people with real commitment to their healing path, uh, if they can change their lives by using like the sunlight RX, EMF mitigation, their diet, homeopathy, um, that we can move more towards that state. And as your body produces a fever, let's say you haven't had one in years, but suddenly now we've, we've done all of these implementations around sunlight, EMFs, homeopathy, and boom, there's a fever. One might think, whoa, that's like, wow, they're really getting sick now. No, this is an awesome sign that the pathogen is actually moving up to a different layer and it's coming up and out of the body. We want it to keep coming up and out, okay? And this is why very often, uh, especially in homeopathy, is that if you administer uh, homeopathic remedies and um, the client starts to have a reaction uh, and they start to experience past symptoms, so let's say... Um, somebody used to get reoccurring uh, pneumonia, okay? And um, they haven't had it for years and they took antibiotic after antibiotic for it, right? And so, uh, but finally then suddenly the one day they have some pneumonia-like symptoms. They get a fever, they're coughing up some phlegm, okay? Most people would be like, that's a horrible sign, but that's a good sign. It's saying that the pathogen is actually coming up through the layers, so then the next sign would be, let's say before the pneumonia, the, the individual used to get like sinus infections, okay? And so then they start to have a really run nose after they've gone through the uh, pneumonia stage. That's another great sign. Then let's say after that, before they had the, the sinus infections and before they had the pneumonia, they had really bad eczema and joint pain. So then they start to experience eczema and joint pain. That is exactly a really, really good sign. Now, Western medicine would see that and they'd immediately try to suppress it. 
but we need to literally pull the pathogen up through the different layers of the body to give the immune system a chance to recover and heal. Suppression is not the go-to answer. We literally want to try to pull the pathogen out layer by layer very gently to help bring the body back to a state of health, okay? So a fever is a really good sign. If you're an adult and you can spike a fever, good for you. Like it means that the pathogen hasn't gone way, way down deep into the deeper layers of your body, especially if you can maintain that fever and you can feel better after you've had the fever and you you don't suppress it. And the fever is a real huge sign that the immune system is strong enough to break through another layer of pathogens to achieve a higher state of health. Um, I'm going to link in the show notes a book that I recommend. It's a homeopathy book, but it talks about these different layers of healing. Um, it's written by my teacher, and um, it's it's a book that I recommend if you're a healthcare practitioner, if you're someone who there is some obviously some medical uh, language and explanation in that. But if you have any interest in um, health healing, I would highly recommend that book. Uh, I'll I'll put it in the show notes for this episode and y'all can take a visit there if you want to check it out more deeply because it really goes into uh, a lot of this that we're talking about here today in some really awesome uh, ways. Um, And there's a lot of scientific studies listed in that book. So you can refer to that as well. So really interestingly, this might shake the boat a little bit, might rock the river. But uh, I want to mention this because we have a real misconception that the immunocompromised are at high risk for developing COVID or other illnesses. Okay, immunocompromised, like if you're really old and you're, you're like, let's just take my grandpa, for example, because he recently passed, but he was literally on his deathbed and he got an infection. Okay, he got exposed to some kind of cold, you know, bug, uh, flu, and that that was it that put him over. But he was literally on his deathbed. So this is not applied to people like that. Okay, Um, but what I'm going to share here is that people with the most intense flu reactions or symptoms tend to be young adults. This population tends to have a stronger immune system and can elicit a strong immune response that represents and and kind of presents more of these full-blown flu-like symptoms, okay, versus older people, okay, not deathbed older, but just older people who are actually sicker, okay, Um, meaning, uh, since you've listened to this episode, the pathology is deeper in their body. Younger people... Um, and this is really changing now today. Younger people are a lot sicker, but younger people, the pathogens aren't, don't tend to be shoved down deep into the, into the body yet. So they, their health is stronger, meaning their immune system is stronger versus older people who've taken more antibiotics, who have taken more prescription drugs, who are exposed to um, more EMFs and uh, things like CAT scans and mammograms and that sort of thing. Um, these individuals who are actually sicker, uh, they tend to be less reactive and produce either more mild or just are completely asymptomatic from flu-like symptoms when they're exposed to a flu uh, virus, okay? Now, this might be shocking to some people because we are told that people who are older um, are at higher risk for COVID and um, things like, you know, infections and disease and, uh, you know, more, mostly infectious disease, right? However, we can see clearly, and, and we saw this clearly in the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, that the people who had the most intense symptoms and effects, and, and honestly, the, the people, the majority of the people who died were mostly young, strong people. And this is because uh, there were a lot of reasons behind this. There were a lot of EMFs just being introduced onto the scene around that time, unfortunately, in the form of radars and other EMFs from electrification um, 
Andrew Furstenberg goes into great detail about this in his amazing book called The Invisible Rainbow. I'll link that in the show notes for you all as well. But I just want to break this misconception is that younger people actually are more vulnerable. And this doesn't mean, oh my God, go out and put your mask on if you're 20 or 30 or like do the hand sanitizer. No, what we want to do is get our Sunlight RX on. Go out into the ocean if they'll allow you to. Go outside. Put your feet into the earth, right? Amp up your diet. Get rid of the alcohol and start eating a cleaner diet. Work on your sleep hygiene, okay? These are the things that are going to help you stay strong and be able to overcome of COVID or pandemic or whatever you're exposed to to help improve and boost your immune system, okay? So let's just end the episode here today by, okay, what do I do to boost my immune system? There are a few things there, and I'm going to just break this down a little bit here for you because there's some key ways to do so that don't involve wearing a mask or staying six feet away from another human. This is insane. It's inhumane, and it, and it doesn't prevent the spread of disease no matter what. The Mockingbird Media is telling you, instead, go outside in sunlight. When you learn how to utilize the therapeutic benefits of sunlight, you naturally boost vitamin D levels. The higher your vitamin D levels, the less susceptible you are to every single acute and chronic disease. Literally, there's study after study after study showing this. And there was actually some vitamin D levels were collected in um, some individuals in Indonesia who actually died, um, they said died from COVID or after testing positive for COVID. Whether they died of COVID or another condition, these individuals, 98.9% of people in Indonesia who died after testing positive for COVID were vitamin D deficient. Whereas only 4% who died of COVID were vitamin D sufficient. And I would even like to know what their actual vitamin D levels were because vitamin D sufficient to me means we're in the 70s. Okay. We're in the 70s uh, to 110, not by a pill by sunlight. Okay. You have your vitamin D there. There's no way in hell you're going to get COVID or, you know, experience anything other than a sniffle or a sneeze um, when your vitamin D level is that high from sunlight. Breathe fresh air, get in the ocean, walk barefoot on the earth, walk barefoot on the sand. This helps restore electrons and energy in your body, okay? The more electrons you have, the more of a healing machine you are. That's a whole different subject, but just know you're replenishing your electrical current throughout your body by doing this. And it's a very, very, very healthy and effective thing for your health and for your immune system. Next, pay attention to your body. Watch the signs and symptoms it gives you on a daily basis. If you're feeling run down, fatigued, if you start to get a scratchy throat, if you start to have a sniffle, these are symptoms your body is producing as a messenger. Listen to those messages and take necessary action to support your health. Try not to suppress, but take a day off of work. Get your Sunlight RX on. Eat lighter. Eat more broths. Take a detox bath. Take a social media and screen break. Take a Wi-Fi break. Get outside, okay? These are common sense things, but of course, the media is not telling us to do these things, okay? But these are common sense things, uh, how to support our health and our immune system and our well-being. If you're not familiar with natural remedies that support the healing process of an, an acute or chronic condition, connect with a reputable naturopathic doctor, herbalist, or homeopathic practitioner to help support your healing process. And remember, every single over-the-counter drug or prescription Western drug suppresses. It pushes the disease down deeper and over time makes your health worse. Of course, there might be times when turning to prescription drugs might be necessary, but the goal is to know your body and the symptoms it's producing, to catch the symptoms right 
at the beginning, okay? Don't let them go into a full-blown bronchitis or pneumonia if you can prevent it. And use nature's medicine kit to help support your healing process. Thanks so much for tuning into the show today. I hope you found this episode all about immunity, fevers, and your health insightful and empowering, especially during this time of confusion, false information, and scientifically unproven recommendations, such as mask wearing, that were being fed by the mainstream media and medical system. For years, we've learned that sickness is a bad thing. And when we present with symptoms, we need to seek out treatments that suppress the symptoms. However, this only drives the pathogen deeper into the body and further compromises your level of health. Instead, we need to utilize nature's medicine kit and learn how to read the signs and symptoms our body is giving us to detect the state of our health and to make our health care decisions. If you enjoyed this episode, I would greatly appreciate it if you could take one minute to rate and review. Each review helps more and more people just like you learn all about radical health, root causes of disease, and how to utilize nature as one of your biggest healing allies. Don't forget to take a screenshot of this episode, share it on your Instagram stories, and tag me at sunlight underscore rx. Thanks again for tuning in and see you next week. The Primal Pioneer podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease in the Western medical sense or terms. It is to be used for educational and informational purposes only. The information shared on this podcast and all of Heather Shepard's work is not a form of diagnostic medicine, nor is it a medical treatment. Heather Shepard is a health educator, radical health practitioner, and a trained EMF specialist. And although she has a bachelor's in science and master's education in alternative medicine, she is not a medical doctor and does not give medical advice. Her work and sharing is to be used for informational and educational purposes only. 